We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he is doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Hallelujah. All right, so beginning from this May, I began speaking on the concept of living long and satisfied. All right, I want to bring finishing touches to that this morning, and I will conclude that conversation. Right, next week I have a special speaker. So this morning I will conclude the concept of living long and satisfied. And this morning, I want to talk more about the afterlife, what happens when we die. And um, I, I wanted to make the topic, what happens when we die, but I said people might not come. So I just said, let's say, call it live long and satisfied. Let me start this way. How many of you love Jesus? Oh my, I never knew you all did. How many of you believe you cannot see Jesus without dying? You know at least. How many of you will love to see Jesus? The hands have reduced. Because you know the way to go there. I said last week that people are not really afraid of death. What they are afraid of... Where is destiny, Daniel? Okay. I see everybody. People are not really afraid of death... But what they are really afraid of is where they are going. People really don't know where they are going. I said last week that if there was an embassy somewhere in Benin, whereby as soon as the killer kills the individual, you would go straight to the country of your choice. You would jack by dying. And you wake up there with their passports and become a citizen if there was that kind of embassy in Benin, even on Sunday morning like this, there will still be queue there. People will be queuing, hastening the killer. You will see people at the back say, oh God, I've been standing here since yesterday. Kill me now. Say, my brother came yesterday. You killed him with poison. It took six hours to die. Don't you have bomb? You know? So, and that's why people of some other religion they have been told that when they die, is it 700 or 1,000 virgins? Who knows what I'm trying to talk about? Are waiting for them in heaven. And so you see them, they, they carry the nuclear missile on themselves, and they detonate the bombs. They are suicide bombers. They are not scared of dying because they are sure that so many virgins are waiting for them. Are you seeing? So... As long as they are concerned, all they can imagine are the virgins. But Christians are not thinking that Jesus is waiting for them. So let's really talk about this. Is death loss. And, 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 you know, you can't escape this topic. All right? You can't escape this topic. You must have understanding as a Christian. When people die, we cry because we miss them. But scripture says... I say it's doing well now. Scripture says we should not do it like those who don't know. So I want to give you understanding. Praise God. Now, appreciate the first facts I want to say. Everybody repeat after me. Say man is spirit, soul, and body. You know we use natural things to understand spiritual things. When you see a fruit, there is an upper layer. There is a middle layer, there is an inner layer. Epicap, mesocap, and endocap. Meaning, you use nature to know the things of God. When we go out to win souls, actually, in the real sense of it, we are not winning souls, we are winning spirits. It is our spirit that gets saved. Salvation is in three phases. 
we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. What was saved? Our, body, our spirits, when we got born again. So it's your spirit that gets saved. That's why it's your spirit that goes to be with God. But it doesn't mean you forgot the bad things you used to do. What is being saved? Our soul. So it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your world. Your mind is your soul. What will be saved? Our bodies. When Jesus comes again. Now, you must know the fate of the spirit, the soul, and the body. The spirit and the soul is not the same. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. It says, and the Lord presents you holy, spirit, soul, and body. Is this King James? All right. Hebrews 4, verse 12. You read that this morning praying. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to what? Piercing to the dividing asunder of what? Uh -huh. Soul and spirit. So, it says the word of God separates soul and spirit. So, soul is not spirit. Are you with me? So, let's start this way. <laughs> Let's start this way. When, when an individual dies, right? What dies? Spirit, soul, or body? Talk to me. Body, right? Good. So we will talk about the fate of that body. But the spirit, what happens to the spirit? And what happens to the soul? Let me start this way. The spirit has a soul and lives in a body. You are not your body. You are a spirit. You know God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Who did he know? Before I formed you, form. You understand? I knew you. So before the body was formed, God said, I knew you. So the spirit existed with God. Are you there? Now we are saying the spirit has a soul. That word soul means consciousness. It's in your soul you have the mind. It's in your soul you have the will. It's in your soul you have the emotions. You know, people used to say things like, when I get to heaven, I will ask Jesus questions. You know, when you get to heaven, you, might not, you will not really ask Jesus any question. Every question you want to ask Jesus when you get to heaven, when you get there, you will recognize that you just know it automatically. Do you remember the story of the rich man who died and went to hell? And Lazarus is beggar. I will read this later on. The Bible says, while in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes and saw who? Lazarus. How come the rich man recognized Lazarus in hell? Okay, let's leave that. Lazarus was a beggar at his gates. But the rich man also recognized Father Abraham and asked Abraham to give him water. You know the story? How did the rich man recognize Abraham? Was there a picture of Abraham? Was Abraham on Instagram? That means... When you get to that realm, you are in a state of knowledge. Are you with me? So, those who think they will ask questions to Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, when you get there, you will just know everything you want to ask. How do you know? You just know. Are you seeing? So, I'm saying that to say, the spirit is the one that has a soul. Now, when you read the Bible... Sometimes when he talks about death, he uses the word sleep. Do spirits sleep? You are not talking to me. Do spirits sleep? The word spirit is the Greek pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. Pneuma means wind. And God breathed into man 
and he became a living spirit. The rendition says a living soul. Are you there? So spirit is wind, right? So um, spirits don't sleep. God is spirit. He neither sleep nor slumber. Is he not? Only bodies can sleep. So when I see the word sleep in anything I'm reading now, know that at that point he's talking about what? Body. Are you there? But let's start this way. Before Jesus, before Jesus died and resurrected, nobody had been to heaven. Before Jesus resurrected, nobody had been to heaven. Jesus was the first person to go to heaven. Are you with me? All the good people in the Old Testament, when they died, they did not go to heaven. They went to hell. But hell, as it were, had two compartments. There was a part of hell that had torment, where the rich man was, we will soon read that, and there was another compartment of hell that was called Abraham's bosom or paradise, meaning that their good works in the Old Testament was not enough to take them to heaven. They needed to wait for Jesus' blood to be shed because it is by his blood you can get there. But because they died, looking forward to a Messiah that will soon come, they were not condemned into the torment part of hell. They went to Abraham's bosom. How do I know? Jesus said it himself. John 3, verse 13, quickly. John 3, verse 13. No man, Jesus was the one talking here. No man has ascended up to heaven. Jesus was the one talking here. He says, but he that came down from where? Heaven. Even the son of man, which is in heaven. So he was saying, before me, there was no one. And that is why he is referred to as the first fruit of resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the what? First, the first fruit of them. That's what, talk to me. Christ was the first person that died and resurrected and then ascended into heaven. Before then, nobody who died went to heaven. Now, follow me closely because I'm getting into our own dispensation and our own faith, right? I hope you know that nobody can escape this earth without dying. For now. Are you with me? Even the people in the Old Testament that you thought did not die, actually died. I think I've said that here once before. People believe Enoch went to heaven alive, but it was written that he died. Okay, show me Hebrews 11. The Old Testament told us how that chariots of fire came to take Elijah. But when you read it from the perspective of the New Testament, they all died. They probably did not die where we could see them, but they died. It's like the way Moses' body was not found. But the Bible tells us that God killed him. Nobody knows where he was buried. So if they were writing in those days, they would say, Moses disappeared, he didn't die. But you can't leave the earth that way. I said Hebrews 11, please. Now, okay, thank you. Start from verse 4. Just the next verse. By faith, Abel offered unto God. This speaks about Abel. Verse 5 talks about another great man. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Okay, let's get that in context. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 7. By faith, Noah, he has spoken about Abel, spoken about, um, sorry, Enoch. Now, this is Noah, eight. By faith, Abraham, nine. This is Abraham now. He's coming down the generations. All right. They journey. This is speaking about Isaac, Jacob. All right. Ten, please. 
they looked for a city. 11. By faith, Sarah herself. 12. 13. Read the first line together, everybody. Is that this singular or plural? So who are the these? All those he has been talking about since. Are you seeing? You must use the New Testament to explain the Old Testament. These all died in. Now, if you keep on reading down, show me the verse where he said, but time will fail me to talk about Gideon, Barak, Jephthah, and the prophets. Go to verse 30 something. Okay. Verse 32. What shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the words talk to me. Was Elijah a prophet? So all of the prophets, all of those in the Old Testament, time will fail him to talk about their faith movement and the fact that they all died. So bottom line was that they died. But when they died in the Old Testament, where did they go to? Oh, I thought I just taught you. They went to where? Abraham's bosom, which was a compartment in where? So their good works was not enough to take them to heaven. But when they went to Abraham's bosom, why did they go to Abraham's bosom compartments of hell? Because they looked forward for a savior that would come. So on basis of that, they were judged righteous. They looked forward to what will soon happen. We look backward to what has happened. Because we are in different dispensations. Are you seeing? Now, when Jesus died and resurrected... The Bible says that Jesus went to hell and preached to the spirits in prison. 1 Peter 3 verse 19. Jesus went to hell and preached to all of them, all of the good guys who were there. By which also he went and preached to the what? Spirits in prison. That what prison is hell. Can you imprison a spirit? So that what prison is hell. All right? So Jesus went and spoke to them and preached the gospel to them because it is only by means of the gospel that they can be saved. Now, of course, they were saved. And then what happened? He now took them on a triumphant entry to heaven. That was the first time the spirit of men got into heaven. Ephesians 4 verse 8. So when Jesus resurrected and went to hell and preached to them, he took them as the first batch to get into heaven. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, what happened? Talk to me. He led captivity captive. What does that mean? People who were captive in hell now became his own personal captive on the triumphant entry to heaven. Are you with me? Show me verse 9. Now, he that ascended, talking about Jesus, what is it? What is, the, what is the important thing about the fact that he ascended? If not for the fact that he also descended into hell, into the lower parts of hell. When he descended, that was when he led them triumphantly into heaven. So, everybody say first batch. So those people were the first batch that entered heaven. They became part of what we call the cloud of witness, cheering on us. Hebrews 12 verse 1, we are foreseeing that we are encompassed with such great a cloud of what? Witnesses. Are you with me? Now, since then till now, People who have died in Christ have not been going to heaven. Why? They are waiting for Jesus to come again. The next time spirits 
will get to heaven is when Jesus comes again. So the Christians who have been dying since when Jesus resurrected and took all of those guys in the Old Testament, where are they? We'll take the Bible the way it is. They are wherever Jesus is. We are not told where they are. How do I know? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. Absence in the body is what? Talk to me. Presence with the Lord. So as soon as a Christian, his body packs up, he is absent in the body. Where is he? He is wherever the Lord is. We are not told anymore if that is heaven or not. Are you with me? This is difficult, right? Absence in the body is what talks to me. Hear the way Jesus talks. Look at what Jesus said to them in John 14. John 14 from verse 1, where he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. He says, You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have what? Told you. Now, now, I go to prepare a place for you. Everybody say place. Now, he said he's going to prepare a place for us. Right? Now, where is that place? Go to verse 3. Go to verse 3. You have to be, oh my. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto the place. Lost me there. I will come again and receive you unto where? So Christ is the place. He never said he was coming. So when he was talking about a place, here the way he talks. He said, I will come again. You know, you can be reading this and be interpreting something else. I will come again. No wonder. He just told them, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. What does that mean? He simply means I'm coming ready for you. Because we have taught it to mean that people have houses in heaven. But you think about what he said. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. How can mansions be in a house? You don't understand. In my, in my bedroom are many duplex. <laughs> So it means, first of all, that it is not what we think it is. So he's saying, I go to prepare a place. Now he now said, when I come, I will receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will also be, wherever that is. So those who die in Christ, where is their spirit, where he is. I will go and receive you unto myself, that wherever I am, there you will also be. So why the body sleeps, what we call decay, scripture says sleep. The spirit goes to be with the Lord. But remember, this is for those who are in Christ. No wonder 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ... He now portrays Christ as the place where they reside. You understand? So, so Christ is now my residence. So the, the hope of a believer is that when our real self, which is the spirit, leaves this body, we will be where Christ is. Colossians 3, verse 3, starts from there. My emphasis is 4. And ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ, and Christ in God, right? Now, verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. So, our faith is waiting on Christ to come again. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, me and you shall appear with him also in glory, why? Because our spirits have been safe with him all this while, waiting for him to come again. So when Christ appears back on this earth, he is not coming to judge us. 
we are coming with him, those who have died in Christ, because our spirit has been with him, we are coming with him to judge the world. So we are not part of those who are going to be judged. We are part of the judges. Coming to judge the world. Are you with me? So the reason, oh my, the reason I will appear with him when he comes again is because I have been with him. Are you seeing this? Now, hold on. You know, this therefore means that if Christ does not come back, that is when you can say that a Christian is doomed. A Christ, and, and you know, now people are trivializing the coming again of Christ. I even heard someone say that, um, you know, they made it sound like it's an imagination. Like he's not going to come physically. If he came physically the first time, and people saw him. On that basis, he said he was going to come again. And that is when the next set of admission will be given. But until then, Christians who have slept, meaning their bodies have slept, their spirits are safe with him. I will tell you how that is useful to you as a believer. First Thessalonians 4. You know, when you know this, you will have some hope about your loved ones who have died in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. I will go on to 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. I will go on to 17. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain... Also, the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are what? Talk to me, which are what? Wait a minute. This means there will be people on the earth when he will come again. They will still live their normal life. Jesus said it will be like the days of Noah. They will be getting married and be giving people in marriage. And he will come again. Not an imagination. He will come again. Now, he says, the people who will be alive and remain will not be a hindrance to those who have already slept, to those who have already died. Why? 16. The Lord himself, himself, did you see that word? Have I lost you? The Lord himself, meaning is not an imagination. Is not, uh, you know, people are using different Greek and Hebrew now to explain it. Somebody said, as soon as you die, he has come for you. No, no, no. See, there, w- there will be a day, and we believe that in this ministry, it's one of our doctrinal tenets. A day will come on the earth. We don't know when, whenever that is, where he will come physically. See how he will come, the Bible says. The Lord himself shall descend from where? Himself. With a shout. So, it won't be in secrecy. With the voice of an archangel, of the archangel rather, with the trumpets of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, those who have died in Christ even have more advantage. Because, remember I said that since Jesus came the last time and took the first batch to heaven, no other has gone, right? Do you remember so, since then, those who have been dying in Christ, they are the ones who will rise first. They are the ones who will rise first. What is rising in them? Body or spirit? Go back to verse 15. Remember, he says that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are what? Remember we said only body sleep. So that means their bodies will rise. Even our bodies will not be lost. God had it all planned out. He didn't just create us to live for 120 years and die and waste away. There is nothing about the believer that will be lost. So they would rise first. When they rise first, verse 17... 
we who are alive and remain. So if you are still alive when he comes, if you don't want to die, we who are alive and remain, what will happen? We shall be hanging out together with him. This will be us floating in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. This will now be the sweet by and by, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then it says, comfort one another with these words. Meaning, if you are not comforted, you don't really understand much of this afterlife. Comfort one another with these words. Now, what this means is that those who have died before us, they will be the first to catch up on that day. What this means is that those who have died before us are not necessarily in our past. They are in our future because they will go ahead of us. And then together, it will be a huge reunion. But remember, this was talking about the bodies resurrecting again. Listen. Remember I began by saying that man is spirit, soul, and body, right? Now, when we die, as it's where, biologically speaking, our bodies decay. But he's telling us that when Jesus comes again, even that decayed body shall rise again, but this time with a better quality of life. That's why when you get to heaven, you would recognize me and I will recognize you. Our identity has not changed because we have the same body, but the quality of life in it is now better. The quality of life in it is now such that can no longer be, be subject to death. The quality of life in it is now such that can no longer be subject to sickness. The quality of life in it is now such that can no longer be subject to decay. Are you following what I'm saying? Romans 8 verse 11. A scripture we all quote. Romans 8 verse 11. It says that if same spirit that raised upwards, talk to me, Jesus from the dead dwell in you, talk to me, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also what? Stop. What does it mean to quicken? It will give life back to your immortal body. Did he say immortal or mortal? When he says mortal, what's mortal? This is your flesh. So it will give life back to the flesh that has become sand. That flesh which in quotes has been decayed. You read it this morning, Joel 2, 25, where it says that he will restore to us the years he can't cover them as eating. The locust has eaten. The caterpillar has eaten. The palmer worm has eaten. Meaning that the bacteria that ate your flesh will vomit it back. And all of the fungi will vomit back. The soil that is decomposed in so will form back the body. Because that same spirit will quicken the mortal body. When Jesus died, when he resurrected, did he leave his body behind? Talk to me. So when he comes again, those bodies will rise back. Are you with me? Those bodies will rise back because that same spirit shall give life again so your mortal bodies, meaning not even my body will be lost. And when it rises back, it will rise in a better quality. I will show you. Are you following what I'm saying? So, it says the body will rise again. Tell your neighbor, say, I can't be lost. Say, I would rise again. Now, 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 watch this. Watch this. Watch this. You know when Jesus was resurrected, the disciples were gathered one day, and Thomas was not there. And they were telling Thomas, he has risen. Thomas said, it's a lie until I see him and touch where the nail pierced his hand. You know that story? Now, the Bible says they were in a closed room, closed doors. Jesus walked through closed doors. Can you walk through closed doors now? But Jesus walked through closed doors, meaning that the quality of life he resurrected with was higher than the one he died with. But he wasn't just a spirit. Can you touch a spirit? 
Remember we said spirit means wind. Yet Thomas touched his hand to feel the hole on his hand. The same body that walks through closed doors could be touched. Meaning he resurrected with a body that had greater quality. Not only that, when Jesus was resurrected, show me Matthew 27 verse 52. People saw their relatives who had died since. They saw their relatives walking on the streets of Jerusalem. Those relatives came up with their bodies. Oh, please, would you help me? Matthew 27. Matthew 27, 52. And the graves were opened. Many bodies, many bodies, bodies of spirits. Are you seeing? I'm trying to show you that God has a plan. Not only to keep your spirit in the streets by and by, even for the body. Many bodies of the world, which slept, because only bodies can sleep in death, did what? Next verse. And came out of the graves. After his what? Resurrection. Meaning that those, that event happened after Jesus resurrected. These people went into Jerusalem, the holy city, and they were appearing unto their relatives. Appearing on so many. So what does that mean? God has it all planned out. Are you feeling what I'm saying? See, God commanded Jesus not to lose us. It's not even about me and you now. God gave Jesus an instruction not to lose us. So what I am saying is, no believer in Christ Jesus will be lost after they have passed on. John 6 verse 40. John 6 verse 40. After this, I'll take questions. And this is the will of him that sends me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may what? Have everlasting life. Do you have everlasting life? Everlasting means everlasting, right? It means it will not end. The last line is my emphasis. Jesus is the one talking here. What did he say? And I will what? Raise him up on which day? By the way, I hope you know the last days have begun. We are in the last days, but the last day will come. Did you hear me? We are in the last days. These last days could be thousands of years. There is no time in God, but the last day will come. The last day is, see, I don't, it's because Christians have not been well taught. So it terrifies them. How many of you, when your father is coming back from work, you will go and hide under the chair? Or you are scared of him? Depending on the relationship you have with your dad. Growing up, whenever my dad was coming back, just know that he must buy something. When we looked forward to it because we will get something as children. Are you with me? When your father says he's coming again, you are not supposed to be terrified. Jesus is coming again. It should give joy to the Christian. That should be the hope of the Christian. But guess what? Christians are scared. You know why? They don't have understanding. Muslims are not scared. But Christians are scared. Why are you scared? The early church, when they met each other to pray and study the word, the way they greeted themselves was by saying Maranatha. You know what that means? Jesus is coming soon. Just imagine I see you this morning, oh Maranatha, Jesus is coming. That was how they greeted each other. Because Jesus told them, I come quickly. So they thought he was coming the next day. They didn't know that the quickly he was saying meant I will come suddenly. I will come when I'm not expecting it, right? But what I like is their anticipation for his coming again. Because that is where their hope lies. But in our generation, we, we are one leg in, one leg out. And it's because we really don't understand it. 
First Corinthians 15, verse 35. First Corinthians 15. The book of First Corinthians is an interesting read. When you want to talk about all right, the end of times and how it will be, you will like First Corinthians 15, 35. Because whatever question you are asking, people have asked it before. First Corinthians 15, 35. But some man will say, some people will ask, how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? So, the, show me this thing now. Eh? The dead will surely be risen, but how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? Because they are surprised. I mean, he must have decayed. Now, Paul was answering that question. He says, next verse, Thou fool, thou which thou sowest is not made alive. Is not quicken, except it was, it dies. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some grain, 38. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him. So, are you saying my decayed body will become fresh again? But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him. Meaning, the body I resurrect with same identity, but God is able to give me that body. He says to every seed a body. Jump to verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It decays. But it is raised in what? In corruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in what? In glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body, a spiritual body. So these bodies still carry their spirits. Are you seeing a spiritual body? There is a natural body and there is a what? A spiritual body. Jump to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all not sleep. Meaning, not all of us will die when this will happen. Well, if it says we shall all not sleep, it simply means that most of us will sleep. Are you with me? Most of us will, actually. We shall all not sleep, but this is the constant. We shall all be changed. What is being changed? Our bodies. In so glorious bodies, we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as the last trumpet, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, meaning raised without the ability to decay anymore. And we shall be changed. 53. This corruptible body must put on incorruption. This mortal body must put on immortality. It is at this point, verse 54, when this corruptible body have put on incorruption and this mortal body have become immortal, that is when the saying shall be brought to pass, which is written, death is swallowed up in what? Meaning, at that point, our new bodies is no longer subject to death. We are now undiable. That is when you can now say, we have victory over death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Do you know that actually, even death itself will die? Death will be destroyed. But we would have overcome death when we resurrect again with bodies that can no longer die. Revelation 20 verse 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the words second death. So even death died. 
because we will now live forever. Take me back to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? So it will definitely be destroyed. How will it be destroyed when we no longer have the ability to die anymore? Because we have resurrected with bodies that can no longer be subject to death. Listen to me, child of God. Don't fear death. If you are scared of dying, you know, that's why Jesus said, he that loves his life will lose it. Two weeks ago, I read you Hebrews 2 verse 14, where the Bible spoke about he that had the power of death, which is the devil. He no longer does. Show me Hebrews 2 verse 14. Hebrews 2 verse 14. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, excuse me, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, that's what, had the power of death, that is the word. So the devil had the power of death, Jesus died to destroy him. Now, but look at where it affects us, verse 15. And deliver them which are us, who through what, talk to me, fear of death, we are all their lifetime subject to what? So when you are scared of death, you will be subject to bondage. Death is too weak. Death is too ordinary to separate you from the agenda of God. I am not trying to make you happy. I am telling you scriptures. Romans 8, 35. He says, who shall separate us from what? Talk to me. The love of God. Now, see what he mentioned. Jump to verse 38. Jump to verse 38. I am persuaded that neither death. He said he was persuaded. As in he's too sure that death is too small to separate him. They were persuaded in their generation. Are you persuaded? That when this body packs up for now, your spirit goes to be with the Lord. And that when he comes again, he will give you a body as it pleases him. Says I am persuaded. You must be that persuaded. For a Christian, death is not loss. Romans 14 verse 8. Whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. Look at the last line. Say, whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or we die, God still owns us. We are the Lord's. We are not lost. Whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. Show me verse 9. For to this end, Christ, both words, died. And what? Talk to me. So why did Christ die and rise again? That he might be the Lord, both of the words, dead and the words. So Christ is the Lord of the dead and the living. So the death, the dead has hope. If they died in Christ, no wonder scripture says precious in the sight of the Lord. Is the words talk to me? The death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. If you read the Old Testament, you will see that there were times where he even praised death. Or rather, he praised the dead. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 2 says, I praise the dead more than the living. Why? If they died in Christ, they have hope. They are in our future. But if you enjoy, see, even if you live for 150 years, it is not long enough compared to eternity. And most of us, by reason of strength, is an average of 100. Between 80 to 120, an average of 100. How far can that be? 
If you are 10 years now, multiply 10 by just 10. You are already 100. You are good. Think more of the afterlife. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. If only in this life we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Meaning, if your hope, your enjoyment, everything you live for is just for now, you are, you are not just miserable. You are miserable more than all men. Because now is a spark of dust when you compare it to eternity. Do you know that actually all men will live forever? Whether believer or sinner. But we will live forever on different destinies. Have you been listening to me? Do you know that all men will resurrect? John 5 verse 28. Marvel not at this, John 5, verse 28. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves, so say all, all that are in the graves shall do what? Shall hear his voice. So those who did not die in Christ, that they died is not their escape. All that are in the graves shall hear his voice. 29. And shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. They that have done evil. Finish it for me. So everybody will resurrect with bodies. And then we will now go into our different destinies. That is where those of us who Christ Jesus has purchased with his blood. And we have responded to it. We have done good. We will resurrect unto life, resurrection of life. Those who did not die in Christ will resurrect unto damnation. But those who did not die in Christ, when they die, where is their spirit before Jesus will come again? The Bible calls it outer darkness. When you read all through the book of Matthew, you will see that language used, cast him into outer darkness, where there will be gnashing of teeth. Have you seen that before? So when Jesus comes again and we all resurrect, we all who are in the second batch will now be going into our destinies so into heaven. And those who will resurrect unto damnation because they did not die in Christ will now be heading into hell fire. There are times in the Bible where the word hell is used. Hell simply means grave. But there are also times where hell fire is used. When you die, hell is grave. The Greek is Gehenna. The Hebrew is Hades. But when people were exorrect from that grave, they have their destinies either in hell fire or in heaven. Hell fire was not made for man. It was made for Satan and his angels. Why? Satan is irredeemable. John 16 says the prince of this world is already judged. Satan is evangelizing people to keep him company in hellfire. Jesus is counting on us to bring in more people to make heaven a jolly party. You know we say as our mantra that God is not angry at you. Come and talk to me. God not being angry is only for this age. In the Old Testament, he was angry. On the cross, he poured out all his anger on Jesus. In the New Testament, he's no longer angry at man. So receive his salvation, he's being on you. But when he comes again, you know, the coming of Jesus separates time. When he comes again, the age of grace is over. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we do what? We persuade men. Can you imagine? He, he, he says, terror, verse 11, please. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. We, so that means, you know, no wonder he says he's a terrible thing, he's a fearful thing. So fall into the hands of the living God. So when this dispensation comes, he's not angry now. 
<laughs> but a time is coming when this age will be over. Paul is saying it is because we know what will happen in the end of time. That is why we are practically begging people. We are persuading them, accept Jesus. Let me ask you a question. This is, what month is this? This is May, right? If you have ever spoken to somebody about Jesus this year, let me see your hand, be honest. This year, let me see your hand. Ah, I'm even impressed. Okay. Ah, Modela. Wow. I didn't know you were born again. <laughs> Let me see your hand. You spoke about, about Jesus. Wow, 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 wow. I will ordain you as a dickiness. Now, the majority of hands are not up. It is only a point that now, me and you, we are Christians, right? If me and you, we are not talking to people about Jesus, is it Satan that we talk to them about Jesus? So I'm just trying to show you that the majority of people alive today on the earth are waiting for this terror. And you know why? Nobody is telling them what is to come. Now, we don't help them to escape this terror by telling them about the terror. We tell them about the love of God because it says, it says the love of God constrains us. So, see what he has done for you. Respond to the love. But if you don't respond, I said it last week, not making a choice is a choice. You cannot sit on the fence. I have read the Bible beginning to end so many times. I have Bibles packed up that I will give to the next generation as a gift. I have written on it. I wish to write my own Bible someday. But I have never seen the word purgatory before in the Bible. And I have read every word. So there is no in between. If you are not a candidate of heaven, you are a candidate of hell. There is no in between. Who are the people who will end up in heaven? People who are believers in Christ Jesus. Meaning, Christ is your life. You know what that means? Go back to Colossians 3, 4. Everything that is doing you is Christ. You cannot have a conversation with somebody for a few minutes and they will not know that this one is a Christian. What? You know, you are talking on Mount Sock. Even when you try to say a parable, what you said is scripture. When Christ, who is our life, that's Christianity. Christianity is not, is not just trying to have the life of Christ. Christianity is that Christ is your very life. He's your very essence. What that means is that the reason why you are here is Christ. When you live here, where you are going is Christ. Everything about you is Christ. We are believers. Believers mean we just believe in a Christ that we have not probably seen physically. And so, to the world, we are fools. But we are the ones that have hope. If only in this life you have hope. You are of all men, most words. No wonder he says, Christ in you. Salve. See, God did not call Christians to do welfare for people. When we do welfare for people, it's because we have something in mind. We are trying to win them over to Christ. Salvation is more important than philanthropy. So if I am clothing the naked and feeding the poor and doing all of that, there must be a target in mind to draw them onto what? Christ. Are you with me? See, see. Heaven is real. The reason why I know heaven is real is because the earth is real. Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven. Now on YouTube, people are saying that heaven is a realm. You know, like it's an imagination. Listen, listen. Jesus spoke about our reward, which is in heaven. Go and read Matthew. Heaven is the event center we are Christians will be giving the accolades. You know, we will make heaven. But we won't all have the same measure of reward in heaven. I hope you know. We won't all have... Go and be, he said, be that ruler over ten cities. 
thou good and faithful servant. Be thou ruler over five cities, over ten cities. You know, your measure of reward is based on the works you did for God while you were here. And when you get there, you will see that there are lay members in church who will be better rewarded than bishops and popes because God sees and God hears. So, what is the essence of this teaching? The essence of this teaching is we are men living in this body. As Christians now, when this body packs up and we sleep in death, our spirit that has a soul has gone to be where Christ is. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. While this body sleeping in decay is waiting for the return of Christ, for it to be glorified into a better body that will resurrect. Are you there? As unbelievers that they are, when this body packs up, their spirit is in outer darkness. And then when Christ comes again, they will be judged into hellfire. Hell is not a punishment from God. Some Christian denominations say, if you say God is love, why will a loving God send people to hell? Hell is not a punishment from God, and God does not send anybody to hell. People send themselves to hell when they deliberately refuse to accept the free gifts of Christ Jesus. So hell is not a punishment. Hell is a consequence of not making a decision for Jesus. Remember he said, not making a choice is also... Do I have questions? Do I have questions? None. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Now, if you are just joining this series today, I'd like you to start from part one, Right? And part one, part two, before this part three. Okay? Go over it again. Good morning, sir. You said anyone who kills a man would be killed by a man, right? Yes, I said that last week. But if that person is now changed and turned a new leaf, after all, the Bible says all things are passed away. Does it mean the person will still be killed by a man? Very sincere question. Do you remember the thief on the cross? Talk to me. You know Jesus died in between two thieves. Jesus looked at one. One said, if you are the son of God, set yourself free and set us free. That one just disdained Jesus. And Jesus didn't reply to him. The other one said, we are here for what we did, but this man did nothing to be here. And he said to him, remember me when you get to what? paradise. Jesus said to him, I say to you today, you will be with me in what? Now, that man stole. Jesus said that the man will be in where? So, when Jesus resurrected, did you think that man would be part of those who will be joined to heaven? Will he? Because Jesus said he will be with him in where? But did Jesus tell the man, come down from the cross, don't die again? Even though he will be with Jesus in paradise, what Jesus did not tell him is, come down from the cross, you will not die again. Jesus never said so. So, you are killed. I guarantee you that you are born again now. You will not be lost. You will make heaven. How will you make heaven? Somebody else will kill you. <laughs> so, is it not good if I'm straight with you? That's why there are, I said that they're breaking an hedge. There are some lines you don't cross. Okay? There are some lines you don't cross. There are some lines you don't cross. Can I tell you about Apostle Paul? He was killing Christians, right? Talk to me. When he was Saul. Right? Was he killed? Oh, he was. He was killed. He did a lot for Christ Jesus. He was killed. People now understand something, eh? There was a time, not too long ago, on Facebook, an argument was going on that God does not kill. 
God is not a killer. And I understand new generation faith people, you know they know too much. For you to say God is not a killer, it, it sounds to me, no, for you to say God does not kill, you are trying to say God is not sovereign. Is there anything that God cannot do? But those who were saying God cannot kill, they were saying that against the backdrop of God is love. Everything about him is life. But what they don't know is that God can kill out of love. Nobody ever told you that when God kills, he's out of annoyance. He's not angry with you. He can kill you smiling. We read the rich man's story last week, and God came to him and said, This night, I would what? Require your soul from you. Hannah said in 1 Samuel, The Lord killeth, and the Lord maketh alive. For our Lord God is a consuming fire. That is a New Testament scripture. There must be a balance to it. Okay? So the point is, don't break an hedge. Are you with me? Don't break an hedge. We have gone to minister to those in prison before. People get born again. Did we set anyone free? There are laws on this, there are laws on this earth. There are laws that govern the earth. And God put it in motion. If I decide to jump off this place, what is my destiny? If I jump off here, will I not fall? Is it God that fell me? What if I'm born again? Will I still fall? When I make the decision and take the action, the laws of physics and chemistry will now support me to get the destiny I deserved based on what I did. It's as simple as that. When one accepts Christ, the spirit is saved. So if the person later becomes an unbeliever, how does the person's spirit get unsaved? You want to get me into something? I know, um, um, what is this? A girl messaged me about this question. All right, I've forgotten her name. Okay, this argument has been age long. It's called one saved, forever saved. If you are not a theological person, I don't know about it. And it's an age, it has been for centuries. And it's an age-long argument. And I'm not really interested in it. But let me just tell you something. Okay, let me just explain it this way to you. You know, people say that once you are saved, you are saved forever. I agree. Against the backdrop of what God has done. When God did it, he did it forever. Right? Talk to me. Do you have any responsibility in salvation? Yes, you do. What is your responsibility? Believe. Are you with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever was. So please talk to me. When you stop believing against your own backdrop, because for you to say, I cannot do anything about it, when God has saved me, he has saved me. If I like, I should sleep around. I should do anything I want to do. I will still make heaven. It will shock you. For you to say that, you are ignoring the free will of man. Salvation is likened to marriage. We are going to become eternally married to Christ. We are his bride. Do marriages fail? Yes, they do. So the point is, is a two-way thing. You are a Christian because God did something. And you believed in what he did. On the back, on, on God's side is eternal. What he did does not change. But on your own side, you have a responsibility to keep on believing. Of course, if you are a child, if you are a baby Christian, you do wrong out of that, God will not say, ah, you know, just imagine my son who is not even up to one year old. Imagine my son can talk and my son comes to me and say, um, father, from today, I don't want to be my father again. In short, I disfather you. What will I do? Come inside, my friend. Why? At his age, because he is a baby, are you with me? But if a full grown man tells his father, I don't want you anymore as my father. The father will say, well, are you with me? So it also deals with your level of Christian maturity. Now, because God is faithful, 
when really mature Christians start getting to the point where they can make fun of the gospel and shame Jesus Christ, before they fall and draw multitude with them, God calls them home. And that is what people who think God cannot kill should know. God calls them home. Why? It's better they come back than being lost. Are you with me? So the point is, the point is, when I am saved, God has saved me. You know, when we were in school, we were born in for Christ. Oh, we were born in for Christ. I know what I'm talking about. I remember after school, it happened to me too. A girl told me, she I don't feel the fire anymore. And I remember it also happened to me too. I felt like I'm not burning as much as I used to. And one day God told me, I have stopped moving you from the outside. I'm now moving you from the inside. But there was this brother of ours. He went on youth service, NYSC, and fell in love with a Muslim girl. Sorry I'm saying that. And on Facebook, he began to make fun of Jesus. Christianity is a sham. Jesus is not real. He does not exist. He was a leader in fellowship. My question to you is, what is his faith? Those who say, um, if you are saved, you are saved. Well, what is his faith? You have to teach me about that. Paul, he has denied Christ. Paul said, Demas has forsaken us. Having loved this present world, Go and read 1 Timothy 4, or was it 2 Timothy? Say, now the Spirit will speak expressly that in the later times men shall depart from the faith. He says, in the later times men, if you can see it, you show me, men shall depart from the faith. Let me, oh, thank you. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the later times some shall depart from the faith. What's their faith if they depart from the faith? Can I tell you something? We think he said some shall depart from the church. That's how we are reading it. They can be in church and leave the faith. They can still be coming to church and not really trust in this, this God thing we are saying might just be, might just be a scam. And that's why it's an everyday work. It's an everyday push. Any Christianity that totally takes away responsibility from you needs to be balanced. You understand? God has done it all in Christ Jesus that you may do. So you don't leave everything on God and then do anything you like. And, there are, and these days, we have Christians, even pastors, top leaders, heavily invested in fornication. And when they do that, they still come on stage. And the anointing flows. Oh, the spirit moves. Because God also speaks through donkeys. It doesn't mean you are a man of God. You know, he said, they said to him, in your name we cast out demons. He said, yes, but I didn't know you. I'm sure that's all right. Christianity is deliberate. You understand? Christianity is not as casual as they are making it look in this generation. For Christ's sake, Jesus died for this. The apostles, the disciples, none of them died well. So don't just think you will casualize it. And just, if you are a Christian, there are things you don't do. Not because there are rules and regulations, but the laws of God are now in your heart. And if you do the things you are not supposed to be doing as a Christian, you can have the repercussion that should come to unbelievers, even though you are a Christian. If a Christian sleeps with someone who is infected with disease, can the Christian contract the disease? Yes. That's the repercussion that should come to those who do that. But the repercussion will not spare you because you are a Christian. Because lazy Christians are trying to give away wrong acts or against the basis, against the backdrop of if we are saved, we are saved. It's all, oh, it's been a long time coming. I used to preach that before I changed. I know one guy who even told me, he said, even if I am on top of another man's wife, if the trumpet sound, I will make heaven. He told me. He told me he was a pastor. That's where we are going to so with that message. 
So even if I believe that one saved is forever saved, I will not preach it. Because we ask myself, how does it help? How does it help? Rise to your feet. Taking more time, again. Who is a Christian? A Christian is someone who has accepted the free gifts of salvation that only Jesus Christ brings. The Bible says Jesus is the way. It did not say Jesus is one of the ways. Jesus is the only way to God. If you are a Christian and you are a believer, you can never be lost. But if you are not a believer, what is waiting for you is terrible. And I must tell you. And so people must change. And let me tell you, see, if you go to a church where the messages don't prick you sometimes, you need to change that church. A real good church, you will hear something sometimes that will make you to slow down on the next wrong thing. Is anybody here? I just want you to make personal rededication of your life to Christ this morning. Now remember, I told you that death will be swallowed up in victory. As long as you are in Christ Jesus, no matter what happens to you, you have assurance. You have assurance. As long as you are in Christ Jesus. There is such a thing called backsliding. You understand? There is such a thing called backsliding. Okay? And if you are a victim of that, you can always come back. You know, you can always come back while you still have the time. But don't let anybody tell you that you need, you can wallow in sin and still be okay. That's not true. There's something wrong with that teaching. So close your eyes this morning and we dedicate your life back to Christ. Asking the Lord Jesus to give you the grace to remain steadfast. There is such a word like that. Steadfast. It is by His grace you do that. You understand? The grace to remain steadfast. We have made church great again for people who are giving up on church. There is actually a simplicity in Christ Jesus. You don't come to God based on what he will do or based on what he is doing. You come to God based on what Christ has done. And the way to do that is by believing and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior.